all my bits in front of me. Okay, so um, say hello in the chat box, just to make sure you know where to pose a question. Um, so if I just introduce myself first of all, just um, who am I? Um, so I, I'm uh, Ross, a uh, teacher, uh, 25 years in secondary schools in London. Um, been blogging online for a number of years, got um, a little bit of a large audience. Uh, I know would visit schools, or at least I was physically until a, uh, seven or eight weeks ago, uh, schools around the world and uh, do my own research and uh, recently a lot more webinars. Um, so that's me. Um, I've been um, uh, given the privilege and honor of sharing all the work um, from Academy 21. So in my own uh, last three years particularly, um, visiting uh, alternative provisions, uh, virtual schools, lots of, different, lots of different types of institutions. Um, and whether, you know, before uh, COVID-19, the virus, it, a fascinating place in which to work. So let me just give you some uh, general introductions um, in terms of the Academy 21 before I get each of the hosts um, to just briefly introduce ourselves. And then we've got a good 15 questions to go through. Um, you should be able to see on your webinar somewhere to raise your hand or pose a question in the chat box. And I've got two or three surveys as we go through. Um, not too many slides, uh, lots of just uh, content. Um, so um, Academy 21, so the website you need um, is on the screen there. So uh, maybe copy and paste that, or maybe I can ask Mark to just type that in the chat box for everyone's benefit, academy21.co.uk forward slash lockdown learning. Um, so Academy 21 has been supporting vulnerable learners since 2011. Uh, they currently work with around 750 students who log in from home uh, or in normal circumstances for other settings such as their school learning centre or full-time AP settings. And they support a range of young people with complex needs, typically pupils uh, or young people, uh, young children at risk of exclusion. Um, some that need respite from their school timetables as they, they may be um, being disruptive or finding learning difficult or they may have a range of illnesses. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail in terms of the benefits and obviously I want the host to um, share those with you but um, my own experiences uh, particularly in the last three, three years visiting uh, at least 200 schools across the country um, alternative provisions are a very very special place um, they're often a last chance saloon for our kids. Um, I won't go into the whole social mobility um, dialogue uh, because I know that you're an educator and you're most likely to share the same views about social justice and those types of things. So um, I'm going to um, ask each of the hosts, so they've got their microphones already uh, enabled, if I can just um, bring you in one at a time. Um, so make sure I've got everyone here. So um, Mark, if I just get you to introduce yourself first as kind of a webinar facilitator, uh, just give your role uh, and then I'll hand over to um, Dr. Sarah De Frittis, to, uh, the Executive Director, to introduce yourself and your role. So Mark first. Hello everybody, I'm Mark. I'm uh, co-hosting with, uh, with Ross today. Any questions you want, pop them in the chat box and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can at the end of the session. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Mark. And Sarah? Sarah. Uh, I'm Sarah Zafratis, and I'm Executive Director of Education here at Way Education PLC. My role is to look after the education portfolio, uh, and that includes Academy 21, as well as our online school, Inter High. And thank you very much for coming. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, over to Claire. Hello, my name is Claire Brokenshire. I'm the Head of Faculty at Academy 21 and I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the education team and I work on timetabling, curriculum and overseeing um, general developments um, in our provision. Okay, thank you Claire. I'm going to make sure I've got everyone. Gareth, Gareth, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah, my name is Gareth Lucas Howells. I'm uh, Head of Education Partnerships uh, for WAY uh, and more particularly Academy 21. Uh, my team uh, are regionally based uh, and we're responsible for developing and maintaining uh, all of our client relationships, whether that is with schools or local authorities, uh, individual services. Um, we manage all the processes through from commissioning, uh, through enrolment, uh, customer support, uh, and the management of uh, all of the students that come uh, into and out of the school. Um, and as has been alluded to, we're 
we're supporting over 750 young people um, at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and that's across around 300 uh, secondary schools across England and Wales, uh, in over 100 different local authority areas. Uh, and okay. welcome all. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, over to Stephen, Stephen Phipps. Afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Phipps. I'm the Associate Dean of Academy 21 and lead on the education front. Um, I've been with WAY for three years now and uh, I've got 25 years worth of experience in uh, education, uh, mainly in the uh, state sector and as a SENCO. And I notice a, a number of SENCOs here this afternoon. So hello to you all. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, Jacqueline? Yes, good afternoon from the UK, everybody. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Daniel. I'm the CEO of Way Education that operates the entity Academy 21. I'm also a co-founder of both Academy 21 and Into High School, Way Education's other entity. Uh, so I've been involved in developing online teaching and learning for the last 16 years quite closely. Um, Way has been operating uh, for most of that time and we have educated tens of thousands of students over that period. So welcome to you all. Okay, thank you, Jackie. And I'm hoping I haven't missed anybody. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go straight to Gareth. Um, and Gareth, could I just ask you to let viewers know a little bit more about Academy 21 and how online alternative provision actually works in practice? Yeah, of course. Um, so Academy 21 began in 2011 uh, as a specialist alternative uh, provision, delivering uh, our services online. Uh, we're a preferred, preferred provider to uh, the association of school and college leaders. Uh, and currently we've been um, successfully accepted onto over 30 different uh, local authority uh, quality assurance frameworks for our alternative provision delivery. Uh, we're commissioned typically uh, by local authority services and more recently I'd say over the last kind of five years plus um, working more directly with schools uh, and each individual project can vary in size and scope so from a, a local authority standpoint we might be working with up to 50 students at a time uh, whereas uh, with individual schools we may be working with with one young person um, for as little as a week supporting um, um, during a period of fixed term exclusion. Uh, we usually commissioned uh, as part of a blended or, or a tailored solution so uh, flexibility in terms of what we do is, is really a key component of what we offer. Uh, the kind of young people we support has already been touched on uh, but the, the, the key uh, factor across all of them is that they are vulnerable learners, uh, they're unable to attend a mainstream setting um, and uh, that can be for, as I mentioned, periods of a few days up to multiple months and years, depending on, on the nature of their referral to us. Um, in terms of practice, our, our, our ethos and approach um, is that ultimately uh, the best place for young people to learn is in a, in a mainstream or bricks and mortar school, as we might refer to it today. Uh, and a service has been designed uh, to offer the, the best opportunity for learners, if they're able to, over time, to reintegrate back into their mainstream setting. Uh, as and when perhaps they're physically or, or mentally able to do so. Um, with that in mind, we're, we're, we're very flexible in approach uh, in terms of the service that we provide. Um, and as I said, it, it could be on a, a very short term basis. Um, and, and many schools, when they first start to work with us, uh, will uh, use our service for a few weeks, uh, really to kind of dip their toe in, perhaps to, to assess whether the provision is suitable for the young person that they may be referring to us. And of course, they may be uh, new to this as a, a form of learning and as an approach within uh, alternative provision. Um, once we've been through uh, the enrolment process, in terms of an overview of, of how the service works, uh, we provide a, a tailored timetable and a timetable offers structure, and that's very important for the learners that we support. Um, but ultimately, it's, it delivers five hours of, of learning, timetabled learning uh, in each subject that we offer. Uh, in live teacher-led classes um, with a maximum class size of 15 students. Um, so in, in keeping with that, we provide three hours of live lessons each week. Lessons are short, they're kept 45 minutes and 40 minutes from next year. And they're supported by two hours of uh, more asynchronous activities, as in um, more content-driven activities, homework if you like, uh, that we set a mark and all is provided online. Um, in support of that, uh, we provide 24-7 access to additional learning content and resources and lesson recordings and we make our, our recordings are made for purpose. Um, 
with no students in, um, and they're designed to support and prevent further gaps in learning ultimately. Uh, and then in addition to that, on a Friday morning, uh, we offer a drop-in session uh, where learners can receive additional support. If they were perhaps struggling with a topic that week, uh, they can drop in and, and get support from a subject specialist teacher. Um, depending on the nature of that, the support that's required, that may be one-to-one, -one, um, but it's typically in a, a small group. Um, just to close, uh, in terms of summary, uh, attendance and engagement, we record for every lesson, um, every single lesson that we deliver. Uh, and our engagement is measured across three factors, which is the effort, understanding and interaction uh, that students demonstrate in class. Uh, formative assessment outcomes are recorded uh, and we provide uh, a weekly report and summary with teacher comments. And at the end of every full term, uh, a subject by subject written report as you would receive in school. Uh, and that will include target working at grades and areas where we think perhaps um, each young person might, might be focusing their efforts in the coming term. Uh, all of that data is made available online and it's easily, easily accessible. Um, it, it, it's important to stress that what we offer is a synchronous service, as in it's live teaching, and perhaps then differentiates a little from um, the approach we've seen from schools in response to COVID, which has, has been um, uh, quite significant in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of scope, but to provide um, uh, learning content through um, um, Google Classroom or other, or other search. Uh, Gareth, I was just going to ask, um, before I go on to the kind of COVID issue, um, mm. can I just double check that, is it three hours a day or three hours a week in terms of the lessons and 45 minute it, lessons? Yeah, it's three hours a week per subject. Okay, per subject. Of live lessons. So uh, the way the timetable is structured, it's one lesson per day in each subject. Okay. Uh, and that's taught Monday through Thursday. Uh, and as I alluded to, we, off, we try and create quite... Um, uh, well a structure for the young people that, that arrive with us um, and so that lesson if it was a year 10 foundation tier maths lesson at nine o'clock on a monday morning would be mm -hmm. at, at the same time monday tuesday wednesday thursday and importantly with the same teacher um, and um, largely with the same peer group um, thank you so in terms of the uh, the covid issue since schools have had to shut their doors what advice and guidance have you um, been sharing with teachers and school leaders that oversee um, alternative provision programs? Sure. I mean, to an extent, uh, with uh, the amount of, of information in the ether and, and everything that's been, been thrown out there by, uh, by publishers and technology providers, we've been quite hesitant really to provide overt advice. Um, and, and that also references the enormous challenge that, you know, we're aware that the enormous challenge really that schools and teachers particularly have had. Uh, to very quickly put a huge amount uh, of content um, on a scale really never seen before uh, um, out there for students to learn and pupils to learn from home. And it's been an amazing achievement really in a time of crisis. Mm -hmm. um, for vulnerable learners, um, it, it's clear that uh, alongside that online content, um, schools uh, have been uh, had their doors open for vulnerable learners, but only 5% uh, it's estimated uh, of those learners have taken up those school places. And so it's clear that they need more tailored support during lockdown um, and, uh, and beyond. Uh, and our advice has been to ensure continuity uh, and minimise disruption wherever they can. Uh, and obviously as part of that, we would recommend a, uh, an approach uh, which is more synchronous or live and teaching online um, in approach. Mm -hmm. um, we're now starting to turn our, our focus really towards what happens in the future uh, as we navigate a way out of, out of this crisis response mode. Uh, and it seems certain to us that some form of uh, social distancing will have to be applied nationally and perhaps that's going to translate to school. Uh, and that's going to disproportionately affect vulnerable learners uh, again. Um, so we're advising schools on the use of, of live online teaching and learning uh, really to provide the closest experience uh, possible to the norm of attending school, uh, to minimise disruption, ensure continuity. Um, and from a broader perspective, it might, might be uh, considered for wider implication and um, application across the school population. Um, if social distancing is to be employed, then clearly um, uh, not everybody, every student is going to be in school at the same time. Um, and so um, school capacity needs to be managed in a more effective way whilst ensuring that, that uh, quality of, of uh, teaching, learning and delivery. Sure, thank you. I'm going to bring in Claire. Um, Claire, in terms of the, some of the tips that Gareth mentioned and also the issues, um, are these tips transferable to other school settings um, who have already had their lives you know, equally disrupted? 
Yes, I mean, I'd like to pick up on what Gareth just said. We do want their experience online to be as similar as possible um, to, to the experience that they do have in bricks and mortar settings. So I would say to teachers, it, you know, apply the same principles of a good lesson to your online lesson and make sure that the content is engaging and accessible. Um, it's very important to have clear objectives in every single lesson that you do, maybe even more so in the online setting because students can get distracted. Um, and use, use the online tools in the classroom as interactively as possible. So you've got reaction um, icons that you can use. You've got um, tools which enable you to, um, or the students to draw on whiteboards, that sort of thing. So the interactive um, classroom lends itself to um, having lots of communication with, with the students in the way that you would in a bricks and mortar classroom. Mm -hmm. But you do need to be realistic at what can be achieved. So um, you might, you, you might just have two or three learning outcomes and stick and stick to those and I would also say you need to think about how you're going to manage your communication um, with the students are you going to be available 24 7 preferably not but if you um, if you want to just communicate with them between nine and five then um, you need you need to make sure that that communication is clear from the outset really okay thank you Claire um, I'm going to bring in um Sarah shortly um, but just before I do I'm going to ask everyone a second question on the screen so that's going to pop in now I just want to get a sense of and I won't be able to cover all issues here but <coughs> what is your workload issue right now it's a very topic passionately uh, close to my heart in terms of my own research and, and field work but um, I, I've got a good idea of what the issues are but I'm curious to see people in the session I know people are working in um, you know, we're, look, we're logging in here from about 25 different countries, so it'd be interesting to see what the issues are. Um, but I, you know, there's a couple of schools that I work with online through webinars with Brazil, their initial uh, response in week, they're in week eight or nine, I think, in lockdown, um, was a notification workload and then uh, engagement back from students. So I'm going to share those results and give you a chance to just put in uh, two or three responses to that. Um, survey okay so we're getting a good number of responses so um here are the results everyone um and then i'm going to bring in sarah um so sarah thinking specifically about covid um <laughs> and the impact on you know the bricks and mortar uh, institutions um are there any specific pieces of advice that you can share with teachers who are still looking um for the best ways to plan an online lesson to help manage their workload yeah, I think the um, the point that came up there in the poll and uh, Claire and, and, and Gareth sort of mentioned it already, which is around um, engagement. So how do we engage students within both bricks and mortar contexts, actually, as much as, as you do in online? With online, you've got other tool sets to, to pull in from. So it's really about looking and seeing what kind of, of, of tools we have to keep that engagement going through the session. So we often talk about having an activity about every five to 10 minutes. So whether that's a poll, whether that's an interactive uh, session, whether that's um, some form of quiz or activity or an animation, that's the sort of, of structure that you want to be bringing into your classes. And you know, I think it is the same whether it's bricks and mortar or whether it's online um, and good pedagogic um, practices are applied the same in, in both contexts, I would argue. And the model that you've got up actually at the moment, I can talk to you a little bit in that respect. And this is a, a piece of work that we've been doing here at Way Education PLC. And that's really looking at how we can develop a model which has already been developing over the last 10 or more years around this idea of leading and following. Um, and what I've tried to do with the model that we've been developing is to try and sort of flip it over so it's a little bit more student focused. Mm -hmm. So rather than lead and follow, sort of looking at it from the student's perspective, learn and explore. And it's really that exploration dimension of learning where you do want to bring in a lot more activity and interaction and engagement with students. And, you know, that model, we're calling it the Lear model. So it's learn, explore, apply and reflect also looks at how you can actually not just teach and learn, but also explore and use that information within a learning context. But also how can you then apply that to really looking like quizzes and how we can actually start to apply that sort of knowledge. And then of course we have to reflect 
again on what we're learning in order to really understand it and, and to really um, to cement that, that uh, understanding. So if you want to advance these slides, Ross, I can just continue on. The different teaching modes there are highlighted as well. Teach, guide, mentor, and um, Grabbed reflect. a couple of screenshots oh. from um, the, the website. I've got this one and I've got oh. some data here. All right, so I, I thought that was going to turn into another model, but I can just keep talking to that. Can you keep uh, carry on to the end? This one? No, keep oh, going. One, that one. Okay. Try that. Uh, no, it's not that one. Sorry. No, sorry. So we just go back to that other one. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, the, so the model is basically uh, based on the Kolb's experiential learning model. So I didn't mm -hmm. think it was going to start to animate. Oh, I almost did on animate um, into the next uh, stage. But that idea of, uh, of the learning cycle, the Kolb's learning cycle, is, is really what this model is based on. And, and work that I've done with Tim Newman at the Institute of Education in the UK has been to create a, an exploratory learning model. Mm -hmm. So that's really what this model is based on, those two bits of, of, of mm -hmm. learning. And it's really about trying to extend how we think about teaching in a sort of standard context to thinking about exploration and guiding. So really looking at different roles of the teacher, not just in terms of teaching, but in terms of guiding, in terms of mentoring and in terms of coaching. And so for me, that, that coaching role and reflection is really about feedback and how we can actually enhance and create feedback opportunities within the class. So those are sort of the main uh, building blocks of, of the interactive sessions that, that we're developing. Okay, sure. And I'll, I'll get that, those slides um, sent out to everybody. Um, in terms of um, specific feedback tips, Sarah, Sarah is there anything um, beyond the model that you've demonstrated or any specific tools that you would recommend to teachers watching? Yeah, we've talked a little bit about polls and quizzes. Um, there's a couple of things out there, things like Quizlet and Kahoot, where you can get free licenses for mm -hmm. that sort of uh, approach. Uh, I quite like Socrative, which is a really nice app that you can download freely and you can also buy licenses for that, where you can just sort of develop different polls and, and do them in the classroom as well as doing them online. And most learning management systems have those sorts of uh, capabilities built in as well. Mm -hmm. We also really like to focus around uh, more authentic assessments. So looking at things like e-portfolios, which allows a lot of opportunity for presentation of skills. Um, and we're developing a 21st century skills matrix at the moment, which is quite exciting to mm -hmm. try and build some of those skills in to the learning as well. So using feedback, using assessment to try and reinforce those key skills as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'll just mention a bit of research I read the other day. I believe it's the first of its kind, which talks about the size of the teacher's video alongside the slides that um, I've called it the size matter on my website and <laughs> apparently the smaller your video screen is on your slides the better for people's retention. Um, Stephen I'm going to come to you now uh, for those who are providing live online lessons do you have any specific advice on the ideal number of students and the types of activities that can keep students attention on screen rather than just logged on to, you know, uh, their phone or uh, a Zoom call as we're doing, having a chat? Um, yeah, uh, of course. I would say 20 is the maximum a, a teacher would like to, to deal with on, on a regular basis. And while you can have large numbers, as shown by th this webinar, imagine if everybody asks a question right now, um, how would we respond to that? Um, you can have larger classes and put a second teacher in to, to man that chat box. But uh, in our particular setting, that's not a, a model we, uh, we run at Academy 21. Um, and certainly the larger the class, the, the more questions that come in, the, um, the more difficult it is for a teacher to manage. So, you know, if you were going for a second teacher, why not have a, a second group instead? Mm -hmm. um, I'd say in regards to teaching, it, it goes back to, you know, really good teaching practice, splitting your um, lesson into chunks, giving opportunities for students to, to contribute and engage verbally via text uh, responses through polls, consider the engagement levels through other interactive means. So, uh, you know, make use of the, the digital resources that, that are available to you. I think there is a, a danger 
online that teachers can talk too much um, and feel the need to to fill every quiet spot with with chatter and uh, at times the you know the students do need to focus and you mentioned the uh, camera um, earlier for mm-hmm. us we don't always use the camera but there'll be times when we want them to focus we'll pause the camera or even turn it off altogether mm-hmm. so Okay, good. Um, thank you, um, Stephen. Gareth, um, in terms of, you know, it's going to be difficult um, keeping students engaged and, uh, you know, the virus, you know, whenever we return to schools, um, in terms of keeping kids engaged and, you know, working away from school, do you have any advice for teachers uh, watch in terms of um, practical interventions for, for, for pupils that may start to opt out? Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously, I'd start with much closer monitoring uh, and have the, the structures in place to monitor uh, that engagement. Um, this is something, obviously, we've worked on over a number of years. Mm-hmm. And I saw from the, the poll earlier, um, their engagement is clearly a, a key concern across, across everyone that's here today. Um, and it's certainly essential when, um, in, in light of the responses to, to COVID and this crisis response I alluded to earlier, um, it, it is principally static content and you have no really transparent means of, of tracking attendance engagement because you're not directly interacting with those students every day. I think if that monitoring is suggesting interventions are needed, uh, um, then, um, and, and as vulnerable groups are, are refusing the school place during lock, lockdown, um, we would advise that you research uh, available support across your local authority. Um, as I touched on earlier, we're on a, a number of local authority frameworks and, and many of them have um, have a range of providers um, across their area um, to support different levels and types of need. Um, they have quality assured um, and they'll often provide that, that detail locally on um, purpose-built sites um, and uh, there'll be clear explanations of the range and type of support uh, that each provider is able to offer. Um, however, it's clear, given where we are in the world at the moment, that many of those uh, that will be local physical provision, um, and they are unlikely, I guess, in the short term, to be able to support your pupils through um, through, through the easing of lockdown, and certainly if they've got to implement um, future social distancing guidelines, which is what we expect to come into force. Uh, we can help, of course. Uh, we provide every student, or uh, well, can provide every student, with a, a short kind of four-week trial, and that's largely, as I touched on earlier, Uh, to assess our suitability. Um, Are we appropriate? Uh, I'd like to say we're successful with every student, but we're not. Um, So this gives an option for typically schools to kind of dip their toe in uh, and test out whether um, we're the appropriate provision and whether the student's engaging with with our teaching and learning practice. Um, This can be blended alongside existing schoolwork, um, however it's being delivered. So I talked about Google Classrooms a little bit earlier, which I know a lot lot of schools are using. Um, and as I said, includes engagement measures for, for every single lesson, lesson. So it can be monitored, monitored very closely to ensure it's an effective approach. Ultimately, it's about variation. Um, as with everybody, if we're doing the same thing over and over again, and, and certainly it's difficult to create and has been difficult to create um, really engaging and interactive content in a very short space of time, um, we'd suggest, obviously, that that, uh, that that whatever provision is put in place for these young people it is varied and also that the, the support structures that you put around them are kept in place and we you continue to deliver that continuity for them. Gareth, I interrupt. You've been doing this for a long time before the virus started. What would be your top two or three practical tips to hook kids in that are starting to get disaffected and not logging in? And how, how do you get them back in practically? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's no... Um, there's no easy answer to that because every every young person uh, is different. Um, for some young people, uh, it, it's about the trust that they develop with their teacher. Um, and you'd be surprised, I think, to learn, uh, given um, you know we work in this kind of virtual space. Um, and, and as Stephen touched upon, perhaps we don't always use the, the webcam. Uh, we don't see our, our students every day and they don't see our teachers. But our teachers develop a really kind of strong uh, relationship with those students. Um, and um, to an extent when they're learning online and in, in this format, um, um, their filter, if you like, um, mm-hmm. uh, can at times not be there. So we do get to know them very, very well. Um, and so there, there is no, uh, no silver bullet. There's no magic fix. It's about understanding the needs of each individual student. 
uh, and varying approach. For some that will be um, bringing in um, differentiated work within the classroom and using the tools of the classroom to, to drive through with some of the kind of interactive content and quizzes uh, and different approaches within the classroom itself. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you. Um, Claire, I'm going to bring you in. Um, I, I wrote an article for The Guardian last week uh, about teachers who have moved to a new school and now having to teach pupils online uh, for a class they've never met. Do you have any advice on no how problem. to get the best No problem. Yeah. Um, as Gareth was just saying, we do, even if we haven't met them face to face, we do develop strong relationships with our, um, with our youngsters. And you've got to remember that youngsters themselves are used to building up relationships with each other um, mm -hmm. without, without necessarily having met each other face to face in special interest groups or various types of social media that they use. So I would say that um, teachers should use the same techniques that they would use in a face to face classroom. It mm -hmm. is always important. I mean, our voice, um, we don't use web. And, you know, having a smile, a positive, you know, positive interaction with the students is important. I would say that the sort of chit chat that you might have with your students about pets or siblings or, mm -hmm. um, or how they're coping with lockdown um, goes down well in the classroom. And um, if, if, they, if you come across as a positive, friendly, supportive teacher who's got their interests at heart, then mm -hmm. you're going to develop a relationship with them just as well online as you would do um, in a face-to-face -face situation. Can I just ask, um, you know, for, you know when, when you take on a new pupil, um, there'll be certain procedures you go through. So um, if you could adapt those for a teacher who's joined a new school that's a, a bricks and mortar school that's now having to teach a child online for the first time and they've not met, what kind of things would you normally put in place through your Academy 21 provision that could be used for teachers in this situation? Well, in Academy 21, we do have a lot of new, new students joining us from day to day. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, teachers are used to welcoming new students into the class. Um, every, you know, almost every day we, we may have a new student. And so it, it might depend on the subject, but we'll often, we'll say a warm hello. And we, mm -hmm. um, we don't ask personal questions because in our context, um, we, we, don't want to sh we don't want to share um, any um, any any sort any of that sort of information, so sure. that can make it a bit tricky, and it's possible that teachers wa watching so you wouldn't get have a, those restrictions. An initial bit of data or context about the child before. Yes, we, we do, we do, because we have um, contact with the mentors. Then the mentors will send us through some information about the students. So teachers will check that information before they meet the students sure. so they will have some idea it's often in academy 21 because we're dealing with vulnerable learners then um, those sorts of issues may be about their educational history it may be about issues they've had recently mm -hmm. but um, it does have to be said that sometimes we don't have a lot of information about the youngsters but that doesn't really stop us getting to know them because we take a kind of um, you know sort of slowly slowly approach so some students may not want to contribute much in the first couple of lessons and that's fine by us we say you know you can just listen and then gradually start to join in mm -hmm. and we do have the facility of going into a breakout room and talking to them individually and at that point we might sort of see we, we would see how they're getting on you know it, it as Gareth's been saying all, all, all of the different children are um, different in their needs and the way they respond to us so you do have to take that very much on a case to, by case basis I think. Sure. Can I just add there, Mark, if that's all right? I mean, um, um, Clara um, mentioned uh, mentors. Um, so uh, one of, one of the, the processes we have in place when a student is enrolled with us, it, it, it's very structured. Um, we won't uh, enroll students into class without certain information. Um, that includes a nominated um, learning mentor, as we would term it, but it's that person at the, the referring school or local authority service that ultimately has duty of care for that young person uh, in relation to, the, to, to their wider needs. Mm -hmm. um, we'd also, you know, our systems don't allow us, physically don't allow us to um, issue login credentials to anybody unless we have a safeguarding point of contact. That learning mentor is key to help us kind of reinforce engagement um, mm -hmm. over periods of time. Um, I, I think I saw a question pop up around whether, uh, whether uh, Academy 21 is the only contact your students have, and it certainly shouldn't be. Um, 
as we, we mentioned earlier, where we work best uh, and where this as a solution works best, it works best as part of a blended solution. Um, so there should be other activities, there should be contact from other responsible adults um, uh, that, that work, uh, and also the agencies that are in place to support individual students with complex needs as well. Um, and, and we form part of that. That's the core part, I think, from an education standpoint, because it's, that's where the continuity is there. And if you think for vulnerable students who may be dropped all over the country at various times, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at kids within a virtual school and we may be placing out of borough, then this is a kind of solution and can provide the one thing that in their life is probably missing at times, which is that continuity and, and consistency of structure. Sure, thank you. Um, so everyone, we've been uh, on this webinar for 30 minutes. Um, I, uh, Stephen uh, earlier talked about 45 minutes for Academy 21 as their lesson length. Now, I'm doing a lot of reading and writing about memory at the moment and cognitive load theory and those types of things. Um, I'm going to bring Stephen back in about lesson length, but on your um, screen, I'm going to bring in the, our last um, quiz uh, or poll, should I say, uh, in your setting or if you're in a bricks and mortar, um, how long are your lesson lengths? Just give me a best fit, um, whether you're teaching online um, day to day anyway before uh, COVID-19 or what have you adapted to now? Give me a best fit. And then I'll share those results shortly. Uh, and then to Stephen, um, you mentioned 45 minutes um, early and you talked about the kind of lesson uh, practicalities. Um, do you think online lessons um, have an optimal time uh, for the students that you teach uh, and, and can a school continue with you know the traditional double English on a Tuesday afternoon type of type of scenario so uh, so there's the results everybody and um, over to you Stephen. Um, it's no different to uh, again all the research out there about different lesson lengths concentration times um, I would say that an online lesson doesn't suffer from low level disruption and uh, like a physical classroom does and, and therefore you can tend to progress through topics more quickly but again it comes back to good lesson planning breaking the session down into chunks making it as interactive and engaging <coughs> as possible considering the tasks that, that, that you're setting and translating the resources that you already have in existence into an online environment to, to make sure that they're um, working mm -hmm. um, I'd also say that uh, again lesson length one thing you might be thinking of with delivery online is is disruption and perhaps have a fallback plan ready to go so we've seen a, an expansion in in online teaching we've got lots of internet providers um, under strain um, trying to maintain a reliable service and, and, and things cutting out so you know do the students know what to do in case of technical difficulties where to go to find those resources so again it comes back to a teacher really thinking through and planning out what they're going to do having those range of activities you'd expect in it in your lesson to, to hook their interest to maintain their interest all the way through um, so yeah I can think people will be going ah but you're sitting at a screen for a longer but mm -hmm. time can fly very quickly if you're engaged and, and you're going through um, really engaging materials so can you give me an idea of um, what habits are you developing as a teacher with different aged pupils for example and, and if I can put you in a corner what's your kind of go-to application or a bit of software that you use well, to be honest with you, we, we make full use of the um, resources that are within our um, classroom. So with the Adobe Connect um, classroom, you do get to use breakout rooms so you can create group work. You can um, do individual work. You can set the polls, question and answers. Um, again, with all these tools that, to help more vulnerable or shy children interact with you with a question answer box in adobe that question comes directly to the teacher mm -hmm. no one else sees that so every question um a student can put those forward without fear of, of you know feeling silly um and you know they're not gonna put a hand up to ask a question by using a microphone they can type it through the the chat box as the lesson is going on so it is really um as a online teacher i'd say it's about knowing your um, system and the facilities that you've got there as a foundation to, to, to then take your teaching online and to do it well sure and um can i just uh, quickly just pick your idea Stephen, about um the training that um 
you develop or share with your colleagues, you know, working virtually? How, how have you upskilled yourself? Well, why have introduced um, a teaching online qualification and uh, that's been uh, successfully launched and, and backed by Sheffield University. Um, Jackie, I don't know if you want to add in some more about that particular course. Yeah, it was uh, uh, quite a few years in the making because we did some market research and there was a lot of demand for a qualification to specifically be able to teach effectively online. And as Gareth and I think um, some of the others have said, particularly Claire, it's all about, you know, the quality of the teaching when you're online. Um, so we developed a course that we had accredited by the ATHE. Um, so it's a higher education award. It's a postgrad um, course and it's a level four. I think Claire here has completed one of the first cohort to um, complete that course. It's very intensive. Um, and quite an aggressive type of course. So it doesn't, um, it really focuses on internalizing those teacher skills to teach online. That's very, very important. So it's not portfolio based in the same way that a lot of qualifications are. It's about internalizing those skills. Um, Claire, do you, do you want to say a sentence about the course having experienced it firsthand quite recently successfully yes well it was um, it was an extremely interesting course to do because we did quite um, a lot of theory as well as practical so we were in a group together of teachers and I coming from Academy 21 um, was um, was pleased to be put with a group of into high teachers because I didn't know them extremely well so we learned a lot from each other we talked about the different contexts in which we teach um, we showed each other lessons you know we took part in each other's lessons and but we also did quite a lot of um, interesting theory uh, on assessment and course length. How, how, how long was the course how often were you doing it it's um, a tech course yeah. um, anybody interested should go to the way education plc site it is open to anybody to take in groups or in Mark, if you can put the the link in the chat box for everyone that'd be great okay. um, claire i'm going to ask you about um after school homework um do you think schools should be given this now? Uh, how does it work in AP before the virus? What are you doing um, now? Um, and then I'll come back to you on kind of knowledge and retrieval practice, those types. Well, historically, we haven't called homework homework. We've called it activities to try and, to try and get away from the negative associations with the word homework. Mm -hmm. And um, within the COVID um, context, everyone's at home. So calling it homework, um, is probably a bit of a misnomer, but I think um, the idea really is that we want to give them some work to do independently once they've finished um, their live online lessons. Um, that's probably the idea that we want to give them something um, to help them consolidate the content. So obviously that's going to depend on what the content is, but I would say make it fun, make it engaging, use some quizzes, that sort of thing, the sorts of um, resources that Sarah was talking about earlier. Um, also, if you're talking about higher level um, students so GCSE A levels perhaps give them a research project that will be in line with their own their own interests so I think you know that whole concept needs to be um, about fostering independent learning. How, how do you uh, in terms of your curriculum plans and then your delivery build in that knowledge retention or addressing misconceptions is it just mm. you know the, 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 the that phrenesis you learn as a teacher and you adapt that delivery online or, or what resources yeah. um, to, to, but, to draw out that knowledge in your, in your students? Well because of the context we work in we have got quite um, rigorous schemes of work and so we do teach a separate lesson each day and that's because um, you may not have the students on Thursday that you had on Wednesday but within the schemes of work and within those lessons there's plenty of recycling that goes on and then um, at the end of each day an activity pops up on the dashboard of the students and that activity is available for them to do um, well they've got a week to complete it and then it goes off their dashboards because we don't want them to be overwhelmed with all these activities sure. um, they've got to do and so teachers will be marking their own students activities and we can see 
which work that we need to review and which work they've um, they've successfully completed. So it's similar to um, in bricks and mortar classrooms. You you use the homework activities to see how how well they're coping with the content, and that you know even though we've got lessons in place for the following day, if you can see that a few of your um, students just um, haven't got a certain concept, then obviously you could introduce a few slides into your lesson a few lessons down the line and you know um adapt accordingly really and and, and how, how how do you address um you know my, my experience of uh, working with twenty five thousand teachers last couple of years uh, marking drives teachers crazy across the world regardless of setting uh, what are the issues in an alternative online setting and how do you address that assessment marking burden also well, we're quite savvy about that because a lot of our um, activities are automatically marked. Um, I'm an English teacher, for example. So say, say for example, we're covering um, an aspect of um, reading skills, then we might have two or three texts where they're, um, they've, they've just got to do um, skimming and scanning skills. And so it's one word or two word answers and you could use multiple choice by that, mm -hmm. for that. And then, and then they'll be automatically marked. Um, and then um, and we, we, we're, mo we're moving towards using Canvas and Canvas is a very good um, resource for, um, mm -hmm. you, you, well, the, the, the marking, you can have rubrics alongside your essay marking, for example. So, um, so the idea is to man manage teachers' workloads and like in English, for example, we, 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 we tend towards, it, not rigidly, but tend towards maybe having two or three automatically um, marked pieces of work yeah. in one week and then one written piece so teachers aren't, um, you know, too overloaded with, with um, lots of essays or um, writing yeah. tasks to mark. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah, I'm going to bring um, you in now. In terms of your own um, kind of field work, your research, um, what, what special skill? I've been quite fascinated trying to unpick how I can deliver meaningful teaching quality online virtually, um, you know, that kind of uh, the, a lot of the nonverbal signals, cognitive load, the, you know, engagement through our looking at the camera, those types of things. What, 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 what have you discovered in your research and experience of what works effectively online? In terms of pupil teacher sort of interaction. Uh, in terms of uh, blended or, learning environments, what, what skills yeah. does a teacher need to have? to work online effectively with, with students? Yeah, I think for, for the facilitation side, so I did talk a little bit earlier about, you know, the teacher guide mentor sort of uh, approach. I think you need to, and I think it, the same is true in bricks and mortar to an extent. I think it's probably a little bit more extreme in online context because the way that you facilitate is slightly different because as, as Stephen was saying earlier, you might not be able to see the students, for example, mm -hmm. or you may have quite large numbers. So you, you don't know exactly what's going on. Uh, you do build up those relationships, but you need to use different sorts of cues. Um, I think that what Claire was saying about connecting with the, with the students, making sure that there is that interaction. But I think the, the other thing about facilitation for me, that I think in moderation, which is quite important to me, is about how you uh, create opportunities for group work and group interactions. And I think uh, Stephen mentioned a little bit earlier about breakout rooms. It's, it's really quite significant, actually, the work that you can do in peer assisted learning and, and with peer learning. And it's, there's a lot of research to show how much better the performance is for students when they are working in groups than even with, with tutor led context in some cases. So to be able to introduce more opportunities for peer interaction, I think is actually really a, a strong aspect of online but it's also a skill set that you do need to develop over time and it's not something that's ne necessarily natural when you're used to being in a more chalk and talk environment so i think those sorts of facilitation skills those sorts of guiding skills and how you work in, in in group work and how you support group work is really important and that is supported really well by the sort of authentic assessment we've been talking about whether that's e-portfolios whether that's quizzes and polls you know all these sorts of tools that you have in your in your box when you're using online facilities are actually really really powerful and i think for me it's a little bit you want to get used to using the tools in the way that you've been using them today ross in a very sort of natural way not in not in too clunky a way what would be so your think, tip for teachers start and synchronize video lessons for the first time live um what what, what would you say there's the number one thing they need to do i think one of the things that's di a bit different is you you don't maybe do so much of the talking i think that sort yeah. of dialogic approach that works so well in a sort of in a classroom i think it doesn't work quite so well 
in online because of the engagement issues. And I think that's, uh, Stephen talked a little bit earlier about chunking. So mm -hmm. I think if you can just sort of modularize content, if you can sort of group things up into five, 10 minute chunks mm -hmm. and try to have activities around those, that's quite powerful. And I think just sort of getting used to, to not so much being in that chalk and talk mode, but being much more in a facilitation mode. That doesn't mean that you're not communicating information in, 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 that can be quite complicated and quite a lot of information. It just means you have to sort of a little bit take a, more of a back seat, I would say, than you probably would in, in, a, in a classroom setting where you know the focus is a little bit more on you. But that said, there are things like behavior, which is much less of an issue in an online context. It, it's actually quite a joy. And I was, I was at an interview quite recently for uh, Academy 21 teachers. And one of them said, uh, you know, oh, it's great that I could just teach the class and I didn't have any interruptions with behavior. And I thought that was actually quite a good observation because, you know, it is quite different in an online context. You don't have those sorts of same sorts of behavioral issues that you do in a normal classroom. So I think that there are real benefits and advantages as a mm -hmm. teacher to teaching in these contexts. And, and get through more curriculum material, I, I guess, as well. Um, thank you, sir. Um, Stephen, and as a profession, you know, uh, my own research on mental health and, you know, it's the research all around as we grow numbers of young people suffering from anxiety disorder uh, disorders, um, in the most severe cases, um, has stopped maybe students attending schools. Have you seen any concerns rise among our, uh, your, your own student body in the last six or seven weeks? Um, for us, yes, we've seen anxiety from the year 11 over exams, as everyone has uh, around the country, um, COVID-19 as well. We've uh, benefited from actually having students around the world. So um, we had a, a student send in a, a YouTube uh, clip um, about COVID-19 from Wuhan. And I was able to share that within the, the two settings. So, you know, to see someone actually going through it before it actually came over to us, we were able to put these type of things in place. Um, and, and yes, our, our teachers are, are particularly sensitive to, to the students and, and think about the advice that they're giving. Um, but actually, in a, in a regular way of working, it hasn't changed for them. You know, if they attend an online school, then, you know, they are continuing to attend in an online school. They haven't had the disruption of those that have been moved out of, of the physical setting. Mm -hmm. Saying that, and, and we, I have got a slide, if you can move forward yeah, to it, the data yeah. slide. We do um, try to survey kids, make sure that we check on their well-being. Um, this is a, a survey that, uh, that we undertook using Educate uh, software, and, and I'm sure many of you out there already use that type of thing to, to survey your students, to, to check on their well-being and, and, and see where the issues are, uh, are coming up. So, you know, again, making use of data to, to keep a check on the students that, uh, that, that you're teaching on a regular basis. Um, moving it forward- gone to your 750 pupils? Sorry? Has this data been sent to your 750 pupils? They it's been sent to many more than that. It's been right. sent to into high, so that's sort of thousands of students. Okay. And could you just give us, a, a for people watching, Stephen, just a summary of kind of issues that you've picked up from this data on the screen? Um, exam stress is, is always the, the biggest issue. Um, this isn't um, a more recent survey, so I put it up there for uh, demonstration purposes. Um, and it's interesting, you're asking a question that I had recently in an academic uh, council about, you know, safeguarding and has there been an increase in, in anxiety? And actually, we have had a very few in comparison to physical schools, because as I said, as this has been their normal mode of working, they continued on in, in the same form but we are monitoring it and, and keeping an eye out of it. We do offer drop-in sessions once a week at Academy 21. We do think about um, how they maintain a healthy lifestyle, means they are learning online. Uh, now, I'm, I'm going to ask a safeguarding question here. I, I'll, I'll assume that the answer will be the, a pretty statutory response for most education settings, but in an AP online setting, um, what specific training have you had in terms of being uh, raising safeguarding concerns, or how do you decipher that information virtually? We do the same training that is expected of a state school. Um, so I've got the designated safeguarding lead certificate, as has Claire. Um, mm -hmm. We do annual updates and training. 
I have um, tailored the training a, a little bit more for an online world. So we've done specific training on mental health online, cyberbullying, etc. So we do have that focus. And of course, all our lessons are recorded. So we've got that, that net there to, to have um, the recording to refer back to if an issue comes up. Okay. But for us, we are dealing with clients. So we're dealing with schools. So if we... Um, recognize an issue we're straight on to the um host school and the safeguarding links there okay thank you um claire and gareth i'm going to ask you both for a response here thinking about um academy 21 is there a type of student that you feel online alternative provision is best suited for and uh, what kind of student needs do you support um, just the latter part of that question, I, I, I guess, you know, from the answers that have been given from, from all of us on the panel today, um, there's a huge kind of diverse range of need that we're supporting. Um, I've been involved in, in, in online alternative provision since it first started in the UK um, in around 2003, 2004, uh, off and on. Um, what I've noticed over the last, particularly the last five years or so, uh, has been a, a dramatic increase uh, in the number of young people who are referred to us with uh, complex mental health and, and, and specifically um, uh, general and specific anxiety disorders um, and that's a large proportion of our school at the moment I would say. Um, it's particularly suitable for those those people groups because they're in control of the learning environment um, whilst we encourage them to use a microphone and to talk to us we don't force them to. Um, so they choose how and when they communicate how they engage with our learning obviously you know, that learning is teacher-led and they're supported uh, as you've you've seen from from Claire's earlier comments with a huge amount of positive reinforcement um, but ultimately I suppose there, there, there is no one-size-fits-all um, we may be working with young people for a week because they've been temporarily excluded from school through to we may be supporting them uh, as an alternative to exclusion uh, we might be working with young people with medical health uh, issues from broken legs through to more complex or transplant patients um, in the past, uh, cancer patients and so forth. So there's a broad range of students okay. that, um, that we support. Uh, we don't group them together by their referral reasons. Um, so they're, they're timetabled into groups based on their individual need. So if we have a young person referred to us with CFS, we'll typically be asked to timetable them into groups in, in the later afternoon. Just to clarify CFS for people outside of... Oh, the... sorry, chronic, chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and those groups are driven by by two things really. One is their ability level, and and, and ensuring that those lessons are pitched at the right ability for them, and um, so that they're able to, to progress. Uh, and also their individual need, as I said, so touched upon, okay. and their individual um, reason they'd be referred to uh, uh, to us. Thank you, Gareth. Um, the time, everyone. Um, yeah, sure. Stephen, um, uh, you know, an online provider, what's been the biggest change you've seen since uh, the lockdown here in the UK? Um, any specific changes you've had to make virtually or none at all? Um, we've certainly had to expand and, and inquiries are, are certainly up. Um, mm -hmm. For us, we're beginning to look at new packages to try and fill the gaps that, you know, the lack of schooling for some students has has created you know so study skills packages to help year 11 students bridge the gap to move on to sixth form these type of things that the company is actively looking at and uh, looking to promote moving forward yeah we will we will be delivering um, a short study skills course after uh, the may half term um, this week. okay um, thank you and uh, just a question for sarah in terms of um, perceptions of online alternative provision and is it an easier gig for kids or, you know, is it just as rigorous and challenging? Just um, any thoughts on an online provision for, for, for pupils? To Sarah, sorry. Sorry, so um, what, is, it, is it different for, um, is um, online provision to, different for, people, for alternative? Watching, how, how, um, what confidence do you give to people watching that it's equally as rigorous and these children can achieve good outcomes? Yeah, we have obviously the highest expectations for all of our students, whether they come into, into high or Academy 21. Obviously, the students coming into Academy 21 um, have had greater difficulties academically often, or they have, you know, some of the, uh, the issues that, that have been highlighted today. So 
while we have high expectations, we, we want to make sure that we give them every support we possibly can. So that's why we have additional support for well-being and health and, and pastoral support. And that's why we do a lot of one-to-one -one support with them. Um, we also want to give them extra support in terms of study skills uh, and various other supports. So mm -hmm. I think additional support, additional scaffolding is needed for this particular cohort. But, um, you know, the same uh, basic high expectations we have for all of our students. We want them to achieve the best they can. We want them to get good quality GCSE and IGCSE qualifications at the end. And we want them to go on to, to A-levels and, and obviously to university study as well. So we do try to give them, you know, career support and, and support across across the piece as well. Sure. And I'm, I'm sure you've got plenty of great case study stories that you can signpost uh, our viewers to. Uh, maybe we can circulate one or two examples of uh, students that have graduated. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, Jackie, um, again, I'm conscious of time, everyone. So I'm probably going to finish about two or three minutes. Um, Jackie, there are some indications that despite the best um, intentions, most schools and teachers find online learning unsustainable in the long term, um, mm -hmm. either because of training. Um, what if you uh, do you have the capacity if people watching uh, want to inquire, even for students that are not in the alternative provision? Yes, we do. Um, and the only reason that it might not be sustainable is because obviously um, it's been conceived for, for teachers here, it's been conceived in a lockdown. And online isn't about lockdown. Online is about integration and uh, liberation. Um, and it's also about flexibility and personalised learning. And we can support teachers and schools with that to make sure that their pupils really, um, we, st we start looking at their learner preferences, which leads to greater engagement, which leads to increased progress in learning, which ultimately leads to um, better outcomes. And we continue to support the both the teacher and the school, um, basically making that transition to online. Because going forward, when all this is, is over, um, I do believe that more schools will be looking at a blended type arrangement, so that in the event of um, something else happening, and I don't mean sort of uh, a, a global pandemic, mm -hmm. but obviously there are always problems with infrastructure, there can be problems with um, recruiting suitably qualified uh, teachers and retaining those for certain subjects. So whatever it is, um, schools need to have, you know, an option, an alternative, and obviously a blended approach is going to be the solution for them. Yeah, and I mean, in, you know, a lot, many of us will know it's been around for a good couple of decades. And, you know, that yeah. question, uh, will we need bricks and mortar in 20, 30, 50 years? Um, where, where can people go, Jackie or Gareth, in terms of the want to find out more about your work? Obviously, we'll send slides and contact details. But um, people that want to get in touch and get kids signed up uh, from tomorrow, where, where can they go? Um, uh, with it, if they want to have children signed up, um, they really need to be in touch with Gareth or our admissions team. Mm -hmm. um, the slide that we've got here is for those teachers that were um, interested in making contact because they want to talk more about teaching online or even joining us as an online teacher. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the best place to go is to the website. It's um, www.academy21.co.uk. Um, it's been specifically designed to answer many of the questions in relation to individual students and whether um, it, you know, our provision is, is appropriate uh, and yeah. to explain that provision mm -hmm. um, and whether we might be the right uh, alternative prov provision solution for them. Um, you can complete a contact form, uh, email us, or if you want to call us direct on 01438 535 001. Uh, we've got dedicated regional teams. Um, that will uh, really kind of work closely with you, consult with you and, and ensure that um, from the outset, um, that, you know, any decision making is, is made with the, with the, uh, the young person in mind uh, and ensuring that we're appropriate for them. Okay, um, so that's it everyone. Thank you um, for everyone for signing up and joining us this afternoon. As I said earlier, uh, I will get this video recording the slides sent to you and any necessary resources. Uh, I just want to thank um, my co-hosts are Mark helping with admin behind the scenes. Thank you, Mark Cooper, um, Dr. Sarah De Frittis, uh, Claire Brokenshire, Gareth Lucas Howells, Jacqueline Daniel, Stephen Phipps. Um, thank you very much, everyone. My name's Ross, um, Teacher Tilka. I hope you are safe, uh, looking after your mental health as well as those around you. Um, thank you for joining me. 
And if you need anything, my email support at teachertalkit.co.uk. And on the screen, Academy 21, a great alternative well before the virus um, and long after academy21.co.uk forward slash lockdown learning. Um, I've been your host. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Thank you, everybody. Bye, all. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye. 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 Bye.